Number 10. Olive Ann Oatman Raised in a Mormon family with six siblings, Olive Ann Oatman was born in September of 1837. When Olive was just 13 years old, her parents, Royce and Marianne, joined a wagon train in 1850. The train was headed by a leader in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints named James C. Brewster. James had a falling out with his followers in Brigham Young, Utah, so he wanted to start his own congregation in California, which he believed would be the true meeting place of the real Mormons. Once the wagon train reached New Mexico, they split into two groups. One went north through Santa Fe, while the others, including the Oatman family, went south through Tucson. Eventually, they reached Maricopa Wells, a rest stop for wagon trains. Locals there warned that if they continued on the road ahead, they could be met with violence from hostile Native Americans. But the Oatman family was determined and continued on their travels. Four days later, though, they encountered members of the Western Yavapai tribe, who tried to barter with the Oatmans for food or tobacco. When the family said no, the tribesmen attacked them. Everyone was killed except Olive and her sister Mary. Olive and her sister were taken 100 miles away, where they were turned into slaves. After a year, they were sold to the Mojave tribe for a pair of horses. The Mojave had been much more fortunate than the Yavapai since the arrival of the Europeans. And luckily for the young girls, they had a bit more compassion. With their new captors, Olive and Mary were no longer beaten. They were treated as honorary tribe members instead. The young girls were given traditional Mojave clothes and even their own plots of land to farm. The girls also received the traditional Mojave tattoo on their chins and arms. It was the Mojave belief that anyone without the tattoos would be rejected upon death, unable to join the ancestral lands in the afterlife. Drought hit the region in 1855, causing Mary and many other members of the Mojave to die from starvation. But Olive narrowly survived becoming more and more part of the Mojave who had purchased her over time. She took on the name of Oach, and when white men showed up, she hid herself away from them. When she was 19 years old, white men at Fort Yuma learned of her existence. Fearful that they'd be destroyed, the Mojave escorted Olive to the fort, where she was immediately dressed in Western clothing and taken away. Olive eventually married a cattle rancher by the name of John Fairchild, and she lived with John in Texas until her death in 1903, at the age of 65. When Olive was taken to the fort after five years in captivity, she was reunited with her brother, who had been looking for her all that time. She wrote a book about her experiences and became a sensation, since everyone wanted to know what she had been through. People came from far and wide to see her tattoo and listen to her stories. If you want to learn more, there are many books on the subject, including her own book, and the blue tattoo. Number 9. Rachel Parker Plummer Rachel Parker Plummer was born in Illinois on March 22, 1819. She and her family lived in what was once Clark County for roughly a decade. But three of Rachel's siblings perished from disease, so the family decided to leave. They went to Arkansas for a while, then moved to Texas in late 1832. Rachel's father, James W. Parker, was a Baptist minister, and most of the folk they traveled with were of the same faith. Rachel's family spent time in Angelina, Colorado, but they ultimately settled on the Navasota River in the fall of 1833. Rachel went on to marry a man named Luther Thomas Martin Plummer that same year, and two years later, the newlyweds welcomed their son into the world. But on May 19, 1836, disaster struck. Rachel's family had just finished building Fort Parker when a large group of Native Americans, mainly Comanches, attacked the small settlement and massacred its inhabitants. At least five people in the fort were killed, and one was wounded. Five others were taken captive, including Rachel, her son, Cynthia Ann, John Parker, and Elizabeth Kellogg. Shortly after the abduction, those who were kidnapped got separated. Elizabeth was taken by a band of Kichai Indians, while Rachel became a slave of the Comanche. The Native Americans also took her son James away, and she never saw him again. Being a slave to a Comanche tribe was about the worst fate that could befall a white woman in early America. Rachel suffered hardship after hardship. She was abused and given insufficient clothing. They dressed her in rags and forced her to work all through the day and most of the night. Because the Comanche didn't typically stay more than three or four days in a single place, 
They dragged Rachel around with them for thousands of miles. She wandered with the Comanche from the Arkansas River to the Wichita Mountains. To make things even worse, Rachel was pregnant at the time she was captured. But despite her hardships, her second son was born in October 1836, and she named him Luther. But this is where the story gets truly tragic for Rachel. As if things hadn't been bad enough already, the Comanche didn't like her new child. They thought the baby was interfering with Rachel's work, and so they disposed of the child. Rachel remained a captive of the Comanche for 13 months before they traded her to a group of Mexican merchants near Santa Fe. The Mexican traders then ransomed Rachel in 1837. In February 1838, she was finally reunited with her husband. Sadly, though, she never learned what became of her kidnapped son, James. Number 8. Sarah Ann Horn Sarah Ann Newton was born sometime around 1809 in England. She was raised in a very poor household, cared for by her widowed mother. In 1827, when she was about 18 years old, she married John Horn, a fairly successful merchant. The couple had two sons by 1831, and that's when they decided to travel to the United States, the land of opportunity. The family moved to New York in 1833, where they were recruited to become colonists in a new community in Mexico near the Rio Grande. John convinced his wife it was a good opportunity. So, in late 1833, they sailed to Copano Bay in Texas. It took two months for the party to travel across Texas to the Rio Grande, but when they finally made it, they rested in Dolores at the Beale Settlement. By the time they got there, the group had already learned of just how dangerous the area was due to the frequent attacks by the Comanche. The colonists in Dolores had a rough life. They endured misery for two years because of poor harvests and repeated Indian attacks. The Horn family no longer wanted to be colonists. They wanted to go back to England, so they left the settlement with the Harris family in hopes of reaching the East Coast again. But along the way, they had to avoid the Mexican army and violent groups of Native American raiders. Unfortunately, they didn't make it very far. A band of Comanches surprised their group and killed several men. One of the men that was killed was Sarah's husband, John. Sarah was then taken captive along with her children, the Harris family, and a German man. When they reached the Comanche encampment, Mr. Harris and the German were murdered. But Sarah and the others weren't in any better of a situation. They suffered great violence, and Sarah was separated from her children. Then, in June 1837, after traveling for three months with her captors, she was traded to American merchants near the current site of the Las Vegas Strip. But of course, there wasn't much gambling going on in those days. Sarah hung around the area for a year trying to purchase back her sons from the Comanche. Unfortunately, though, she learned that her younger son had died from exposure. And for a reason nobody learned, Sarah's elder son wasn't for sale. It's not confirmed, but some believe that he may have defected and joined with his Comanche captors. Sadly, Sarah never learned the fate of her other son, and she died in 1839 from injuries sustained during her imprisonment. Number 7. Fanny Kelly Fanny Wiggins was born in a place called Orilla in 1845. This was in the province known as Upper Canada, which is now Ontario. In 1856, her family decided it would be a good idea to relocate to Geneva in what would soon be the state of Kansas. But it was a hard trip. On the way, her father died of cholera, so the family was forced to settle in Geneva on their own. Soon after they arrived, Fanny married a man named Josiah Kelly, a farmer that had been discharged from the Union Army. Josiah didn't really like it in Kansas, though, so he dragged Fanny and the rest of his remaining in-laws on a journey across the country to the great state of Idaho. They brought two African-American servants with them as well as their neighbor. It was a fairly large party joined by more and more people as they traveled closer to the Oregon Trail. While in Wyoming, on July 12, 1864, the party encountered a huge group of Minikonjus and Hunkpapas Native Americans. They were led by a war chief whose name was Ottawa. He was described as being painted in war colors and equipped with deadly weapons. The Kelly party was vastly outnumbered and seriously outgunned so all they could really do was attempt to placate the massive group of about 250 warriors. They sat down for a parley, but a messenger soon arrived with news that U.S. soldiers had murdered a group of natives on the Missouri River and stuck their heads on poles. The natives grew agitated after hearing this and started shooting the members of the Kelly party. Josiah Kelly ran for his life and managed to escape. 
but two of the women and two of the children were captured, including Fanny. On her first night in captivity, Fanny tried to escape but was caught and beaten. Mary Hurley, another woman who had been kidnapped, slipped away into the dark, but her body was found several days later filled with arrows. On a good note, though, a woman named Sarah Larimer and her young son Frank successfully fled the next night, and they were reunited with their family at Deer Creek Station. But Fanny was the unluckiest of all the survivors. She was taken back to the encampment, where she was almost rescued by the Union Army. But the Sioux natives fled, and after a few days, the army gave up pursuit. She soon found herself being the exclusive property of the war chief, who was over 75 years old and mostly blind. People kept trying to rescue Fanny for months, and at one point, a group of four wagons arrived to purchase Fanny's freedom. All of them were killed, though, except for one. Fanny was ultimately brought to Fort Sully in December 1864 after being dragged around for six months. Eventually, she was reunited with her husband. Number 6. Millie Durgan In 1864, Millie Durgan was captured by a group of Kiowa Native Americans when she was only 18 months old. The Kiowa took young Millie with them to their home in what's now Oklahoma. They had captured many people during their raid on Elm Creek, and most of them were returned within the year. But the kidnappers refused to give Millie back. She became the foster child of a Kiowa warrior named Al Soant Sai Ma. Because his wife had given him no children, he took on Millie as his own. This may be hard to believe, but this wasn't that unusual of a situation. If a captive was too old, they were treated harshly as little more than slaves. But a child that was young enough could become one of the tribe. Historical records from the Oklahoma Historical Society show that Millie's family was desperate to get the young girl back. However, the group continued to lie, saying the child was either dead or they had no idea of her existence at all. But in truth, they were painting Millie's face anytime they had to interact with white people so that nobody would recognize her. Millie grew up as one of the Kiowa, and not only that, but one of the wealthiest because of who her foster father was. He was one of the most important people in the tribe. She learned everything the tribe wanted to teach her about animals and nature and making things like moccasins. She even married a man named Gumbi and had a child. In the end, Millie lived through a cultural shift in which raiding parties ceased to exist, and many of the tribes were assimilated into American society. All of her children were converted to Christians, but Millie stuck to her Native American beliefs. Eventually, she settled in a small home near Mountain View, Oklahoma, and lived a long and peaceful life. At the time of her death, she had 32 grandchildren, 12 great-grandchildren, and 9 children of her own. Number 5. Mary Jemison Mary Jemison was born on a ship in 1743. Her parents, Thomas and Jane, had gone on the boat in Northern Ireland with dreams of prospering in America. When they arrived, the Jemison family joined other Irish and Scottish immigrants and traveled west to the frontier, as it was known at the time. The frontier was Pennsylvania, but colonists didn't know it was beyond that. They settled on some territory that was overseen by the Iroquois, and unfortunately for them, this was in the middle of the French and Indian War. Early one morning in 1758, a raiding party attacked. The party included a group of Shawnee Native Americans and their French allies. As a result, Mary Jemison and most of her family were captured. As they traveled, the party got smaller and smaller. By the time they reached the Ohio River, Mary's parents, her neighbor, and about five other people were killed. Only Mary and a young boy named Davy Wheelock were left alive. Mary was eventually sold to a group of Seneca Indians who took her down the Ohio River. This began a new chapter in Mary's life. She was adopted by the Seneca and was given the name Corn Tassel. According to what Mary told her biographer, she was purchased by a pair of Seneca sisters to replace their brother who had died in battle fighting George Washington. Mary quickly picked up the language of the natives and soon found herself right at home with her new family. At the age of 17, she was married to a man named Sheninji, and Mary said she truly loved him. But as the war was coming to an end, Sheninji was worried the white man would take his wife away from him, so he took Mary 700 miles away to New York. This journey proved really difficult and her husband passed away. Mary arrived in New York and lived with her husband's family until she married another man named Hiakatu. Together, they went on to have six children, 
Mary lived with the Seneca Nation until her death in 1833, and she was buried on the Buffalo Creek Reservation. Number 4. Susanna Johnson Susanna Johnson was captured during an Abenaki raid on Charleston in August 1754. She and her family were forced to march for weeks through the wilderness of New England and up into Quebec. They ultimately arrived at the Abenaki village in what's currently the French part of Canada. The Johnson family was held for ransom until they were purchased by a French family. Then they were forced into slavery. Susanna and the rest of her loved ones were stolen by Native Americans and then purchased by the French. In 1754, they were put to work in a French household living in Montreal. The family was together except for her son, who'd been adopted by the Abenaki and wasn't allowed to leave. However, her husband James was briefly allowed to travel to New York. There, he tried to raise enough money to purchase his family's freedom from the French. But when he returned to Quebec City in 1755, they were all thrown in jail. The family remained in prison for two years. During that time, every last one of them contracted smallpox. Susanna ended up giving birth to a son in 1756, but he only lived a few hours. Then, in 1757, Susanna and her family were exchanged for French prisoners. The family arrived in New York on December 10th, but Susanna didn't see her son, the one who had been adopted by the Abenaki, until six years later, when he was ransomed for the sum of 500 livers. By that time, the boy was 11 years old and didn't know how to speak English anymore. The only languages he spoke were Abenaki and French. Number 3. Clara Harrington Clara Isabel Harrington was born in Ohio in October 1847. She lived a fairly normal life and married a veteran of the Civil War named Richard Blinn in 1865. She and her new husband settled in Perrysburg, and they had a son together that they named William. But there was opportunity to be had farther west, so the family packed up and started their long journey in 1868. They took a train to Kansas City, then transferred their stuff onto mules and wagons before embarking on the road ahead of them with two other couples. Richard got into business with a man named Jack Buttles delivering supplies to government outposts. They were traveling along the Arkansas River with eight wagons, 100 cattle, and 10 men when they were ambushed by a force of 79 Native Americans in October 1868. The attackers stole four of their wagons and took Clara and her son hostage. The few wagons the attackers couldn't steal were set on fire with flaming arrows. After the attack, the group went looking for Clara and her child. Then, they discovered a handwritten note that Clara had carefully placed along a trail. The note read, Willie and I are prisoners. They are going to keep us. If you live, save us if you can. Richard Blinn did all he could to find his wife, writing down every detail and lead he came across in his journal. On December 29th, months after his wife and child had been seen, he wrote that he'd give his life for his family and that he was afraid to go on through the world alone. He wrote that if he only knew where they were, he'd feel better. But in his opinion, to live and think what atrocities had been done to them was a fate worse than death. His journal went on like this as he continued his solitary journey in search of his family. With only himself, what little money he had, and his horse, Richard chased stories of them across America. Then, on January 15, 1869, Richard finally learned that Clara and his son were dead when Colonel Hazen presented him with a scrap of Clara's dress and a lock of Willie's hair. Richard was absolutely devastated by his loss, and he died shortly after from tuberculosis. Number 2. Hannah Dustin Hannah Dustin was an English colonist who was captured by Native Americans in 1697. She isn't exactly a household name these days, despite the fact that a massive granite statue of her stands near Concord in New Hampshire. But in the days of early settlers and pilgrims, Hannah Dustin was a folk hero and legend. Remember that these are very different times, so keep that in mind as I tell you this story. Hannah was born in 1657 in Massachusetts. This was a time when English colonists and the French in Canada were involved in serious fighting. The Native American nations were losing a huge amount of their population, up to 80% in some cases due to the wars being waged. On March 15, 1697, a group of Abenaki attacked the town of Haverhill. At the time, Hannah was at home with her neighbor, Mary. The natives took the women and some of their neighbors, and they all went to Canada. Hannah had given birth only a week before the attack, and sadly, her child never made it across the border. 
The kidnappers left the women in the care of a Native American family made up of two men, three women, and seven children. The natives assumed the women wouldn't be dangerous, but while their captors were sleeping, Hannah Dustin and her neighbor Mary armed themselves with tomahawks and killed all ten of them. They were helped by a boy who had been living with the family for a year named Samuel Leonardson, who was only 14 years old. Hannah and Mary killed and scalped all ten of their captors, then left in a canoe. They then presented the scalps to the General Assembly of Massachusetts, and as a reward, the women were given 50 pounds and a reputation as heroes. Number 1. Mary Rowlinson Mary Rowlinson was the sixth of ten children in a massive English family. She was born in 1637 in Somerset. Then, at a young age, she was brought across the Atlantic Ocean. The family settled in Salem, then moved to the frontier town of Lancaster. At the time, Lancaster was in the Massachusetts colony, and in 1656, Mary was wed to a man named Joseph Rowlinson, a Puritan minister who had received a Harvard education. Then, for the next 20 years, Mary was an ordinary Puritan wife. Everything changed, though, on February 10, 1676. A contingent of Narragansett warriors attacked the colony and took 24 people captive. 17 people were killed, and Lancaster was burned to the ground. Sadly, Mary's young daughter was murdered, but three of her children were taken as captives alongside herself, and they were taken west into New Hampshire. It was a particularly gruesome experience for Mary because of her Puritan belief that all Native Americans were agents of Satan. Many Puritans in North America in the 17th century believed the Native population had been put there by Satan himself to torment the settlers. The journey Mary went on spanned 150 miles in 11 weeks, but she'd finally be sold for ransom at Princeton, Massachusetts in May of 1676. After she was given freedom, Mary went on to write a book titled a Narrative of the Captivity and Restoration of Mrs. Mary Rowlinson. It was published in London, then in America. She became the author of the first English book published by a woman in North America. Thanks for watching! Do you think you could have survived the brutal Wild West? Let me know in the comments below and let me know what other topics you'd like to see in the future. Be sure to subscribe and I'll see you next time. Bye!